So good afternoon. So I'm going to talk a little bit about you know how do we start to leverage a variety of data, uh, so-called big data for personalized healthcare, to truly build a patient-centered framework. And uh, in fact, you know, as I was listening to the talk before my mind, and the idea of disambiguation and attaching an ID, that would be so much useful even in the healthcare arena if we can deduplicate all the records and give everyone an orchid ID maybe. Uh, that'll be good. So if you go back in time to 2010, four years ago, and if you look at the, our estimate of national health expenditures, about $2.6 trillion. $2.6 trillion is being spent on our, uh, on our, health on our healthcare. And, especially, and in this pie chart, a special attention I'd like to draw to the hospital care and physician clinical services. About 51% of this expenditure is in physician clinical services or hospital care. And that's led to all the changes that we are seeing as well in, with the Affordable Care Act, whether it's reducing readmission rates or making a, accountable care organizations or patient-centered outcome research institutes and what have you. So a lot of the focus is coming on how do we start to make a dent, especially in hospital care and physician clinical services. And, and given that they make 51% of the $2.6 trillion back in 2010, they would, even a small advance in this area would lead to a significant savings. And what's come about as a result, and I quote from AHRQ, is the notion of patient empowerment. That instead of having the, instead of focusing on a disease or disease-centered model, let's focus on the patient because the diseases do manifest themselves differently across the patient groups, across each patient. So there's a different progression of a disease, there's a different notion of a wellness, or there's a different notion of a health, there's different lifestyles and environmental factors that go on these, fact go on these things. So let's, instead of having a disease-centered model, let's advance towards a more of a patient-centered model. And in that patient-centered model, one of the motivations has also been, how do you empower the patient via a dialogue between the physician and the patient. Not just a, I walk into my physician's office and I'm told, Nitesh, you have this, and it's all right, thank you, and I leave. How do you empower the patient to actually have a meaningful dialogue with the physician? And that's actually quite challenging as well, is because the information flow is often one way. And so how do you actually provide information in the form? How do you provide communication in the form wherein there can be a dialogue as a result, where there can be empowerment as a result. And something that I would also like to highlight here is uh, that a focus is shifting towards how to make patients active participants in their own care and receive services designed to focus on their individual needs and preferences in addition to advice and counsel from health professionals. So this idea of individual needs and preferences and they can take care and make them active participants in their own care. So when, and, and those, that's these three sent few words or three sentences are sort of the driving theme of our research program where we say, can we first understand the patient better by leveraging the data in the EMRs and, and the personal health records and things like that? Second, can we start to personalize the the care delivery model for them, personalize the wellness model for them, personalize the chronic disease management for them, and, so, and also provide an interface to whether it's an, it's an ACO, a physician or a nurse, or a, a, a community health worker, to have a more effective engagement uh, with the patient. Now this is all good, this idea of patient empowerment, patient engagement is all good, but this is also not a new idea, right? 2,000 years ago, Hippocrates said, it's far more important to know what person the disease has than what disease the person has. And 2,000 years ago, he was talking about patient-centered care. He was talking about let's focus on the person instead of the disease. He was talking about moving away from a disease-centered model. So the idea is not new. It's just that we are coming to realize it now. We are, or we are the, maybe the data revolution is leading us to realize it now from a, from a care delivery perspective. So the driving question of our research, as I said, is all about that personalized care, patient engagement, figuring out what are the needs, how do you suggest what wellness plans may work, understanding what are my disease risks. So we ask a simple question as to what are 
my disease risk. So imagine walking into a physician's office and at the end of your visit, you actually get a listing on these are your disease risks and what you should do about them. Each one of us gets a personalized assessment from that perspective. Not focusing on a disease per se, focusing on each one of us in the physician's office. And in doing so, we can actually start to build what's my earliest onset of a disease, and then I can start to prevent or intervene early enough. Prevention or intervention early enough will lead to savings in the hospital services, in the clinical outpatient services, et cetera. And they're in the savings lie. How do we truly start to build an earliest onset model so we can prevent or intervene early enough, not quite for a disease, but, but more for a person? And why we can do that is because similarities and shared experiences matter. More than 60% of the factors governing our health and wellness are related to our lifestyle, are related to our environment. Yes, there is a genetic component to it, but lifestyle and our environmental factors govern more than 60% of our exposure to diseases, of our progression of diseases, of the comorbidities that we may develop, of all the chronic conditions and how we even manage them. So if similar, so that sort of brings to fore is the individuals in a large electronic medical record of millions of patients, whether it's in the health exchange of, the, of, of, of in Washington, D.C., or a health exchange in the state of Indiana, uh, where I'm from, there's millions of patients' information out there. And these millions of patients' information, there are people who share lifestyles, who share the environmental exposures, who, sh even, who may share some of the pre dispositions they may have to some of the diseases. Can we leverage the similarities and shared experiences? And we do that on a daily basis, right? I mean, we are so accustomed to recommendations on movies when we go to Netflix, accustomed to recommendations on music or books when you go to Amazon.com or music when we go to iTunes.com. So we are accustomed to leveraging data about all those people that we have never met, but we'll trust them to tell us what movie we should see or what book we should buy, or what music we should listen to. And we do that all the time. We follow that list of recommendations, we can go, yes, let, that's great. So now imagine a system that would tell you, just like disease uh, movies you would enjoy, books you would enjoy, welcome Nitesh, these are the diseases you would enjoy today. And uh, so, so that, that is the idea of our building the, uh, the collaborative assessment and recommendation engine. We are leveraging the patient information from millions of patients out there completely de-identified, no knowledge of who they are, but just knowing what diseases those individuals have. And think about me and my diseases as me and my books or my movies or my, or my, uh, 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 or my music. It's the same kind of a vector. And if diseases are expressed from a lifestyle and environmental perspective, are ex are those, those lifestyle and environmental factors are expressed in our uh, disease progression as well. So, so that's what we're trying to develop, and I'll sort of tell you a little bit more about what the system does, how it works, and, and how we uh, draw inferences and the evaluations that we have done with it and the pilots we are running on it. So the way it works is it sort of comes in with an individual. Let's say I walk into my physician's office. I walk in with my individual medical history. I compare it against all the other patients out there, and I compute a similarity score. Now, computing the similarity is fairly complicated. It's, it's not as straightforward as one would compute similarities in terms of movies or music or books. So in this case, now Netflix asks us to rate movies between one to five, and Netflix knows what movies we have seen or we haven't seen, and we know what movies we have not seen. In terms of diseases, I only know what I have been diagnosed with, one, and if if I don't have the disease in the database, that does not mean I do not have the disease. It could be I have not been diagnosed with it yet. So what does zero mean? What does absence mean? And second, I don't remember ever giving ratings to my diseases. Hey, I like this disease number five. I like this number two. I don't do that. And so when, so when that rating system is not there as well, so we don't have that preferential bias towards movies or books or towards, towards diseases like we have with movies and books. So we basically have a binary field I have it, and I don't know if I don't have it. That's all we have, right? So then how do you construct the, the, the machine learning or the statistical framework around it? And the second thing that becomes important in computing the similarity is, so the first database that we evaluated our algorithm, we had a database spanning over four years from Medicare between 1990 and 94. 
uh, the identified anonymized data, and of 13 million patients over 32 million visits. So it was really longitudinal data for, uh, for a large number of patient pool. More than 30% of that population had hypertension because of, these, because of the age group. So just because I have hypertension, I'm similar to 30% of the patients just on that one disease. But that's not giving me any, much, any more value that, you know, yes, you have to, how do you compute a similarity? So what, and then as a result of that one strong factor, the relatively rare diseases that I may share similarity on were not coming to, coming to bear, were not coming to light. So how do you now bring, so give a higher weight to, to a relatively rare disease versus a very common disease that 30% of the population just happens to share because of one variable that's constant, that, that's similar is the age factor. So we had to think about that perspective as well in our, in our modeling work. And then we also had to think about another, comp another scenario when you're computing similarities is, when did I develop a disease? Mostly the, book, the book's recommendation or movie's recommendation don't worry about when in our lifespan we saw a movie. They, left, they use that information to build our interest profile. But diseases matter. If I'm computing similarity of me to all of you in the room based on my diseases, when did I, you develop something and versus I develop something? So that timing of disease also becomes very important. At what time and what other comorbidities were there before the, or during the development of the disease? And then you compute similarity on that basis. So we had to truly come up with all of those factors in, in developing our collaborative filtering model uh, where we had to look at a best match subset, which was looking at the time. We had to look at you know, the similarity to look at ones and zeros. How do we compute that? And in worst frequency, we, we decided to weight the uh, relatively rare diseases slightly, he uh, slightly higher than uh, more common diseases. And then we built an ensemble of these models. We built multiple models because they can be, let's say if I have a disease vector of five diseases, I could compute similarity to patients based on all five. I could compute similarity to patients based on two out of five, three out of five, four out of five, or one out of five. I could have multiple levels of similarity analytics I could do uh, with, my patient, with, with the patient pool. So we did many of those and we built an ensemble and we basically took the uh, highest prediction that came out for a particular disease from that ensemble because diseases are not protective against each other. So instead of averaging, we went for the highest and computers cheap. So we, uh, and we can do many of these simultaneously. And what that resulted in was a rank list of disease risks. So why we focused on a top 20 ranking of disease uh, uh, list was at, at the University of Notre Dame, we do not have a school of medicine. And the, the, and the way I st started building a collaboration is I, I have MOUs with the area hospitals and the health exchange and the clinics. Uh, and even now with, with schools and we're doing pilots with independent living facilities for seniors and uh, with the community clinics, et cetera. Uh, so was working with those physicians and one of my physician friends commented that I had these ROC curves and I said, look how sexy my ROC curves look. You know, they had such a high AUC, we beat the other baseline models and things like that. He responded saying, what should I do with it? Because that physician's incentive was not that the ROC curves are looking good and we'll get a research paper out of it. That physician was not in the school of medicine. Physician was a practicing physician and was more worried about how would it help me deliver care? How do I optimize my day? Can I see more patients in a day because of these predictions? Can I, see, uh, can I go home earlier and see the same number of patients? Do I reduce my readmission rate or do I reduce this? So there were all these other things that were more important. And as well as having a list of top 10 or top 20 diseases that I could be at risk for. He said, I can eliminate a few of those because I know things that I would have been more concerned about, those are the things that sort of become an action plan. And that's the patient empowerment then, that how do you develop an action plan towards the management? So that's sort of you know, led to our progression towards more of a list uh, approach, and even I'll talk about how we do that evaluation as well. So the data set that we initially did the uh, uh, evaluation on, as I said, was a Medicare database. It was an inpatient data, 13 million patients, 32 million visits. And it was only ICD-9-CM codes. We had no other info, we didn't leverage any other information about uh, in the data. We didn't have any doctor's notes, we didn't have any uh, uh, lab results, we didn't have any, you know, any other biometrics, we didn't even have family uh, information, so to speak. All we knew was ICD-9-CM codes. And then we also recently acquired 
uh, 500,000 outpatient data, which is spread over 12 years. And this is outpatient from a regional hospital uh, in Indiana, and uh, which is spread over 12 years. And again, it has the same structure as an ICD-9 CM code only. Nothing else that goes with it. And uh, the way the way the uh, algorithm works is so the sort of the, the overall framework, the overall architecture I presented to you earlier, that can also be represented by one this master equation. But there's a lot of different computations that happen here. So if I'm uh, uh, predicting on a disease J, and I'm the active patient A on whom the prediction is being made, uh, I look at what's the baseline probability of the disease J for the cluster I fall in. The cluster I could fall in could be based on my demographic, could be based on my family history, could be based on my pre-exposure to certain things, could be based on the, you know, the clinician's best uh, prior belief assessment on what that baseline probability is. And then we compute a similarity, and we basically say that how similar am I for this disease for every patient in the training data as compared to what the average scores come out to be. And then we compute this all, and then we assign me a probability of having a disease J. We do this computation for every disease in the database, for every ICD-9-CM code. We compute a score for every patient uh, in the database. So every disease is scored, every patient is scored. Now something else that we do here is unless my, this, this is where the, 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 the source is that when we compute similarities and we assign uh, uh, additional probability, if my baseline probability, let's say, is 0.25, and this maximum can go to 1.0, so this can maximum attach a value of up to 0.75. If my increase that I give to a baseline probability is not statistically significant, I will not make a prediction. So we basically only make a prediction if it's statistically significant at 95% confidence over the baseline probability. Because what our physician friends told us is don't tell me something that I already know and I've already communicated. Tell me something that gives, you, gives me enough confidence to create a plan about. I, already, I may already be creating a plan about things that I can guess or, or I can estimate uh, based on the prior history. So this is again, uh, you know, sort of a prognostic mo a model which is gonna talk about what I may be at risk for uh, developing. And then we compute uh, an iterative version, as I, as I mentioned, we compute the ensemble version out of it. Uh, and then we also develop the time-sensitive version, as I talked about, where we actually look at the timing of a disease as well, not just comparing if two individuals have same diseases, when in time did those individuals develop those diseases. So we also compare that similarity too. Uh, and the way we ran our experiments here, where we did leave one visit out, leave one patient, leave one visit out. So for the 13 million Medicare database, we left one patient out as a testing patient, as the active A patient that we were making a prediction on. And we predicted one disease. So let's say I'm in a system with five visits. And I take my visit one. I provide it to the algorithm, to the care algorithm. It makes a prediction on visit two to visit five. And I evaluate how accurate those predictions were. Then, you know, we simulate a scenario that I go back to the physician after my visit two. So now my, tra my training record is visit one, visit two. I use that to compare to all of you, and I make a prediction on visit three, visit four, visit five, and so on. So we do that for every patient in our database and for every disease that, uh, every unique ICD-9-CM code that exists, uh, existed in the database. And so what we could get in terms of a baseline coverage is so the baseline was 32%, which was based on the cluster I fell in. So we, we, we created similarity groups of patients, and we said, okay, what cluster you fell, you fell in? And then we said, based on that cluster, what's the baseline probability of the disease in that cluster? So that was the best guess uh, from a baseline perspective, estimate from a baseline perspective. And then we developed our, we made a prediction on eye care, and we get 51% of future diseases in the top 20. What that means is, of all the patients in our database, on an average, 51% of an individual's diseases that I would develop in the future, we were predicting in the top 20 predictions. Uh, and, and, at a, uh, and this is, of course, statistically significant. And some of the things that we don't predict on, we don't predict on if we do not beat the baseline at a statistical confidence. So we basically don't even make that prediction because that's known knowledge. 
We don't predict on chronic diseases. So if I've been diagnosed with diabetes and every time I go in, I've been diagnosed with diabetes, yay, I'll always get it correct, but we don't predict on that because it's, I have already seen it in my training rectum. We don't predict on progressions wherein I go from 402.1 to 402.19. You know, it's something of that. So we're only predicting on the new novel diseases uh, from that perspective. Uh, and so we get a fifth, we are able to get that kind of a coverage, which is, which is quite compelling. Uh, even if it's in, in talking to a, uh, from an from a evaluation perspective, that covering somebody's 51% in the top 20, and if some of these could be acted upon at the earliest onset, such that prevention or intervention could happen, even for a small portion of the population, that 51% of $2.6 trillion could be very effectively contained from that perspective. So, and the average ranking of our predictions was 5.67. Uh, 5 so, you know, of course, you know, some of the things that happen here is that, you know, we are computer scientists, you know, we also worry about, you know, how do we, so the algorithm was good, we were, we were excited by the first set of results we got, but then as we were scaling it to a bigger population sets, bigger population bases, you know, it's comparing similarities across patient pools, across a big disease vector for everybody is computationally expensive. So, and even collaborative filtering, which is what Netflix or Amazon, the family of algorithms that, uh, is whether it's in books or movies, it's also computationally expensive. And the average number of unique diseases for our patients is, you know, whether it's up to nine or uh, a 10. So, so the number of unique diseases across our patient pools is also, a, it's a function of that. So not only it's a function of how many patients I have, but how many unique diseases that exist in the data. And now we're also looking to incorporate prescription information, uh, family history information, and everything else. So our similarity, our vector for computing similarity is only going to increase. So we basically implemented a distributed, a map reduced even model such so that we could leverage uh, distributed computing that scales beautifully. And the reason it scales beautifully is that my similarity to all of you is independent of his similarity to all of you. Right, so we have independent similarity vectors to all of us. So all of us could be an independent task that could be done simultaneously. And, and even, and I can do certain clustering up front to reduce uh, some of the compute time for on-demand generation of, uh, at the physician's office. At the batch processing way, this is really good. So in a batch processing, if a physician knows this is my appointments for the next day, run care the night before and, and provide the recommended disease risks for everybody uh, in the pool. So where we are going with this is that we are looking at uh, uh, what the first question that we started with in our research program is can we develop something around patient empowerment, patient-centered outcomes, such that for every individual in the database, we can answer one fundamental question, what are my risks? Let's face it, in a physician's office, I'm not worried about what person next to me has, I'm worried about what I have. So what are my risks? you know, from a, uh, prognosis, from a prospective uh, standpoint. And then what should I do? That's also very compelling is, because often the message is a broadcast message, right? Natash, go home and eat broccoli, it's good for you. I hate broccoli, please, I'll never eat it. Even if you tell me 10 times it's good for me, I really don't like it, I, and I'm being honest about it. Uh, and so instead, tell me something else that'll give me, eat, eat quinoa, you know, which is, <laughs> uh, tell me something which I may enjoy understand who I am from that perspective, what exercise program I work. I work with community clinics, and, you know, and, and in talking to, I've become an anthropologist as well almost now, in talking to the patient population, and you know, they're given an antibiotic, there's no refrigeration, what's the point of giving an antibiotic when it'll get spoiled in 24 hours because this individual does not have a refrigeration at home? Or giving somebody a prescription to go get, but a check for Medicaid has not, or, or, or Social Security hasn't arrived, so they can't even go and pick up the medicine for two weeks or three weeks. So a lot of these factors about health and wellness, or if I am living in a community where there is no healthy foods and grocery shop out there, where there is no recreational facility out there, those are the factors which govern a lifestyle, our environment, and those are the things that we are missing in our electronic medical record. When was last a physician asked you, can do you walk, do you have a healthy grocery store next door, or uh, can you walk to a recreational facility, or, or knowing more about, you have refrigeration at home, or, or things like that, right? So those are the things that we believe if we can start to collect, then it becomes a much more personalized wellness plan to respond to my risks. 
And then we got to sustain wellness. So we are basically trying to leverage a lot of a socio-ecological model, which is built around a person, which is a dynamic socio-ecological model, where we have social networks inbuilt and all the other factors uh, inbuilt. And that's, that's sort of in our platform, that's what we're trying to do is we have the uh, EMRs coming in. We're running multiple pilots right now where we are bringing in social networks, education, recreational information, and nutritional information as well to bring in a complete story. And I'll quickly tell you about a few pilots that we are doing. So we are going to launch a pilot the, this uh, fall, uh, the, the spring, next spring actually. Our IRB process will start this fall. So once the IRB is done, where we are working with uh, 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 pregnant women, and one of the th challenges we face in St. Joe County is we have relatively higher rates of infant mortality. And what we find is, is in the first trimester, a lot of women don't even see a physician. Uh, and so there are these you know, behavioral factors and lifestyle factors and everything else that become important. And, and we're also collaborating with the Center for uh, Women and Fam Children and Families uh, in, uh, in South Bend to even have a first three years after a child's birth. So really building in the continuum from that perspective, and we are partnered with Everyday Health, uh, and that company is giving us, giving us access to content from what to expect when you're expecting book, the digital content. We are working with prenatal care coordinators who work with these women. So the idea is that these, uh, the mothers will have their own uh, mobile uh, technology, a personalization messaging system, and, and, and all of that which is linked with your social network uh, knowledge and, and, this, and uh, EMRs and the uh, prenatal care coordinators will have their own access into what their patient pool is doing. So that way it becomes a two-way co communication. We talked about the dialogue and the empowerment. We're doing something with adolescents. We are working with a middle school, and we're basically doing similar things about nutrition, activity, community, and goals. And the idea is that at the back end, it's all our algorithms and all our engine about personalization, messaging, data moving here and there, all the plumbing of data. That, that was being talked about, all the IDing and things like that. In the front end, we're changing the, the layer to see how does it work now for obesity uh, from adolescence or childhood perspective. We're doing something with a diabetics population um, uh, in a community clinic. What does it work for a chronic disease perspective? What lessons we can learn? We're doing it with a senior uh, population. We're working with, we're having two pilots with two different independent living facilities for seniors and seeing what we can interface and how, how we can pan those things out. So, and the, the reason that we are doing all these pilots is for us to truly understand with the most difficult population that we can work with on a wide variety of the, uh, of the scale, what are the challenges in the last mile? When we talk about translating, what challenges we face? And these are some of the publications, uh, and this is the email and the website, and I've gone over by two minutes, so we only have two minutes for questions, I guess, now. Thank you.